right, well, good morning once again, and happy Mother's Day to all of our beautiful, God-fearing mothers here at Faith Community Church. Can we give our moms a big hand this morning again? <laughs> and I'd like to especially tell my mom, Sharon Brock Glessner, how much I love her and appreciate her and admire her for being the absolute best mother I could have ever asked or prayed for. This is too tall for a short pastor, all right. She also gave me the short gene, which I'm not as appreciative for, but she's not in this service anyway. I'll cut that for the next. Uh, but seriously, her balance, as I was thinking about it this week, of gentleness and strength, of wisdom and patience, of kindness, and, and really her courageous counsel, her faith in her love in God, and for me, has really been the guiding voice of my life, even at this point of my life. And so I'm blessed to call her mom. I love her. I thank God for her every day and certainly today. Um, and now at this point in my life, I'm blessed to get a front row seat and watching another great mom, my wife, Leanne Brock. You just heard from her. Uh, what a joy it is to, beautifully, to watch her beautifully and faithfully raise and rear our children. They're blessed, and I'm blessed to get to stand by you through that and, and watch and see how God uses you as a mother. You're a great mom. And so to my wife, to my mom, and to all the great God-fearing mothers of Faith Community Church, I can't say it enough, happy Mother's Day. Amen? Amen. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> so we do have a gift for you. It's not much, but it's a good reminder. It's this little mirror. We're going to give this to you on your way out to all of our ladies. It says, women of faith are a reflection of God's love. And, whew, scary. <laughs> I am not a woman. I do have faith, but never to look at myself in a mirror again. Um, we also have another gift for all of you, and I don't know if you've noticed it. Um, we got new chairs. Yeah. So let me just quickly tell that story. It's, a, it's really a, a miracle of God. About six months ago, got together with my staff, and we were kind of going over some of the different kind of hierarchy of needs of what we may want to plan for, budget for, save for, try to raise money for, and, and one of the, the high things on the list was new chairs, and I was like, I really feel like we need new chairs, and so one of my staff members was like, well, there's a couple in our church who for a couple of years now has been wanting to buy the church chairs, and for whatever reason that hasn't happened, and I was like, put me in touch, and so I met with this couple, and I'm thinking I'm pitching to him and to her why we need chairs and seeing if they'd still be interested in helping us with it. He came to the meeting to my office thinking he was pitching me on why we needed chairs. <laughs> and 10 minutes into the conversation, he had tears going down his eyes. He's like, are you telling me that I've convinced you that you're going to let me buy you chairs? And I'm like, you're going to buy us chairs and I've got to, you've got to convince me of that? Of course. <laughs> and... It was just so amazing, and even this morning when I talked to this guy, of course, they want to remain anonymous. They're doing this not to receive earthly blessing, but spiritual blessing, and um, he had tears in his eyes, and he's like, Tim, it's not just what God's done for faith community. He's like, but all of the chairs that we had here, we've already been able to give 400 away to other churches all across the country, some up in Mesa, some in Tucson, some in Alabama, so even our old chairs are a blessing to other people. And so thank you, Lord. Thank you uh, to this anonymous charitable couple who's got a heart for us. And, and now our backs and our, can I say booty cheeks in church? Is that okay? <laughs> Elder check. Maybe I won't in the next. But isn't it nice? They feel so good. It looks good. It smells good. I've got that new church smell. Amen. All right. How do I get into a sermon from that? I think I ruined it for us. All right. If you have your Bibles, grab them. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Um, Man, I can't believe it. We are 13 weeks into a study. We've been working our way verse by verse through the book of Ephesians this semester, this spring. And isn't God good? We just happened to land on Ephesians chapter 6 on Mother's Day. I love it. So if your Bibles are open, uh, you'll, you'll look at those verses in a moment. But what we're going to do, just to kind of put my cards on the table, is we're going to consider today quite simply, how do we live under God as children and how do we live under God as fathers and mothers? If you remember from previous sermons within this series, Ephesians started with Paul talking about the glories of what God has done and what God has given to us in Christ Jesus, how he gave and sent his only begotten son, the son of God, Jesus Christ, to come to forgive us, 
to rescue us, to redeem us, and to draw us into the forever family of God. That was chapters 1 through 3. And then starting in chapter 4, halfway through the book, Paul begins to explain how we should, as the people of God, respond to what God has done for us in Christ. And he uses the word walk five times. In fact, next Sunday, we're going to do a full sermon just on the different walks. But he talks about walk, walk this way, walk in purity, walk in love. And then he concludes by saying walk in wisdom. Now, what is wisdom? Wisdom is the idea of I understand how God intended the world to work. That God had an intention when he developed the earth and, and human structure. And so wisdom is saying, I understand how God intended the world to work, and I'm going to operate well within that God-given structure and mandate. And so from there, Paul starts unpacking what godly wisdom looks like in our life as it works itself out in different areas of our existence. He talked about how, what walking in wisdom looks like within our love life and even our sex life. He explained what walking in wisdom looks like in a marriage between a husband and a wife. And today in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul is going to get into how we relate and operate as a family, as parents and children. Notice verse 1. He starts with the kids and he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, that's a good place for an amen if you're a mom <laughs> or a dad. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. In other words, quite simply, this is very straightforward, but children responding to your parents and in, in, in responding to their leadership, responding to their authority with obedience is the right thing to do. It's an appropriate, God-given thing to do. And then Paul backs up that statement by pointing to and quoting from the Ten Commandments. He says, honor your father and mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So what Paul is saying is, hey, Christian, part of walking in godly wisdom, part of operating wisely within the structure that God has established for our lives and for our world, part of that is that we honor our parents, that we obey our parents. Why? Because first and foremost, it was a command that God gave back in Exodus chapter 20. Back when God, through Moses, was developing a new nation, a new people with a new set of rules and expectations. Back when God was laying out for them, telling them how to function as a people and how to be structured and organized as a society. And one of the institutions that God ordained and put structure to was the family unit where God essentially said, hey, I'm going to establish a nation by building an authority structure with specific roles and responsibilities, the role of father, the role of mother, roles that come with a certain set of authority and a certain set of leadership that the child needs to honor, obey, and, and come under. And as you respond to them, as you obey them in this family unit that I've ordained, what God is saying is you also do it as a means of following me. You do it as a function of following your God. Oh, and as a bonus blessing of honoring this family structure that I've established, God says, I promise that things will go well with you and that you will live long in the land. Now, I, I know for me, when I used to hear that last part, I used to have all these different ideas running through my mind, like, what exactly does that even mean? Does that mean if I don't obey my parents, that God is going to strike me dead with lightning? That if I ever talk back to my mom or dad, that I better stay inside and duck because I'm about to get struck? <laughs> Thank you, Rose, for laughing. No, what, what it's essentially saying, ultimately what God is saying is that, yes, individually, there are absolutely negative ramifications when we disobey God and, and therefore by disobeying our parents. There is personal ramifications to our disobedience and dishonoring of our parents. But more specifically, and I think what we often fail to notice, is that God built and structured this society, this world, in such a way that we're going to win and we're going to flourish as a people, as a community, as a culture, as a society, and as a world if we honor these God-ordained institutions. In other words, if we honor and keep this authority structure in place, then our society, our culture, and our land is going to win. It's going to flourish. 
But on the other side, if we don't value and honor this God-instituted role of parents, if we don't hold in high regard or high esteem this relationship, this dynamic between parent and child, then what's going to happen on the flip side is that our society is going to lose and we won't collectively flourish in our land. And this principle was true in Moses' day, it was true in Paul's day, and it's true in our day today. Statistics are very clear that when family structures break down, there are increases in drug abuse rates, in suicide rates, in depression rates, in high school dropout rates, in the early sexual activity, the early sexual debut of children, in almost every conceivable category, when the family structure as God instituted begins to break down, the kids lose. We don't dwell long in the land. We don't do well. We don't go well. But then on the other side, the flip side is the University of Alberta did a study and compiled data over the course of 15 years. And what they found is that when young people had a strong bond between them and their parents, that these people, compared to their counterparts, had lower levels of depression, higher levels of self-esteem, higher levels of healthy intimacy, and stable romantic relationships. In other words, after 15 years of studying people who had good, strong, healthy relationships with their parents, they learned that these people tend to do well. They tend to flourish. In other words, modern secular research shows us that if you honor your father and mother, then things tend to go well with you. Now, they did, wow, they did a lot of work to come to that conclusion when all they had to do was open up the word of God, Exodus 20, Ephesians 6, because God has been saying this from the very beginning. Amen. You say, okay, but Pastor Tim, be a little more specific. What does this obedience to our parents look like? What does it look like? Well, the word obey in the original language is really a combination of two words, listen and underneath. In other words, to obey essentially means I come under your authority, and I listen to you. So what does it look like to obey your parents? Well, first of all, it looks like listening attentively. That when your parents speak to you, when your parents counsel you or advise you, that the way that you honor God, the way that you honor this God-instituted structure is by listening attentively. And so when your mom calls you, I don't care how old you are, and your mom starts calling you about, hey, make sure you're doing your laundry. Don't let it sit there in its mildewy stank. You know, are you paying your bills? Did you pay your electric bill? When your mom calls you and starts giving you, like, nursing tips and baby tips, if there's a propensity in you to hear that and go, oh, mom, I know. Just stop. Stop parenting me. I'm 25 years old. Then hear me. That says more about your impatient and arrogant heart than it does about her being a nagging parent. Why? Because part of our honoring God, one of the Ten Commandments of God, includes our obedience to listening intently to our parents. And listen, don't underestimate or undervalue the wisdom that they may give you. Your mom and dad have seen and I would dare say survived some things And therefore, they probably know some things that could be and should be a benefit and a blessing to you and to your life. And so part of honoring God and part of uh, obeying our parents, it includes this just listening attentively to them. But it also includes listening responsively to them. In other words, have a heart that's open and inclined to obey what they say. It means regardless of your age, have a heart that wants and is willing to respond to them. Have a heart that wants and is willing to honor their position. It means that you have a heart that wants to hear them out when they're sharing their thoughts and their knowledge and their counsel on life and living. Do you remember when Jesus was around 30 years old? He had just launched his earthly ministry, and his mom came up to him at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Remember that story? And she comes up to him. I don't know how frantic, but she was, she was a, her heart was racing. And she said, son, th- this big wedding, th- they're out of wine. In other words, do something about it. And, and what did Jesus do? He said, mom, it's not my time yet. Remember that? In other words, what adult Jesus was doing here is, hey, mom, I've got a plan. 
I know what I'm doing. I know when I need to start laying out this whole Messiah thing. I don't want to do it prematurely. I know what I'm doing, mom, is basically what Jesus said. So he sort of pushes back on his mom's request, but what's also true is he ends up doing it. In other words, what's so incredible is that Jesus finds a way to stay on his timetable of announcing himself as the promised Messiah while also honoring his mom's request. In other words, Jesus didn't hear his mom say that and just feel completely obligated like, Ugh, well, my mom's making me do this, so somebody bring me a chalice of water. Woo, why? And make this big deal out of it. He didn't do that. If you read the story, um, he performed this first earthly miracle fairly covertly. He did it discreetly. Why? Because he was able to balance all of these things. He kept his messianic timeline. He, of course, was honoring his heavenly father, and he was still able to obey his mom. And listen, if Jesus Christ can put himself responsively under his earthly mother, then you can too. You can too. And I promise you, it won't mess up the mission that God has for your life if you'll obey your mother. And all the mothers said, amen. So as we seek to obey our parents, we do it by listening attentively. We also do it by listening responsively. And then Paul says that we are also to honor our parents. Honor your father and your mother. So what does it look like for us to honor our parents? Well, honor means that you ascribe worth to something, that you place a high value on something. So how do you do that with your parents? How do you give honor and worth to your parents? Well, for one, you speak graciously to them. You speak graciously to them. This is a functioning of the outworking of what Paul had said in the previous chapter when he said, speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. In other words, when we speak to one another, when we're going to open up our mouth, it should always be in a life-giving, redemptive way. I almost think of it like a gospel soap that I want to wash my mouth with every day, where if I have to, to disagree with you, and in every relationship, there's going to come those moments. Some people just try to agree with everybody all the time. That's not realistic. It's not healthy. There's going to be times in our relationships where we've got to push back, where there has to be a disagreement, where if you're doing it with your boss or your, your spouse or your, your parents, sometimes you're going to have to say, hey, I'm not sure you fully understand where I'm coming from. Or, hey, I'm, you're, you're telling me to do this, and I understand that you are my authority, but can I explain to you the full picture, the full situation, because I'm not so sure we're on the same page with that. In other words, when you have to bring in some resistance, which sometimes we do even with our mom and dad, then you still make sure that you're doing it in an honoring, life-giving way, that you're still seeking to bless them, that you're still seeking to be responsive to them in a way that doesn't degrade them at all. So if mom and dad, mom or dad, doesn't say something quite right, you, you don't degrade them and go, oh, you have no idea what you're talking about, old man. Don't do that. You don't say, mom, you just, you just have no clue. You're, just too, you're too old. You don't get it. You don't do that. Rather, you go, mom, let me just explain to you my heart and, and the full situation, and I'm going to do that with grace, I'm going to do that with honor, and I'm going to do that with, with, with love. I'm going to try to draw you into the full picture here. You know, earlier this month, I was in a meeting with uh, one of my associate pastors, Pastor Jake, and we were going some, over some administrative stuff here with the church, and I was trying to get him to explain to me what we were doing and why we were doing it, and I was confused. I didn't quite understand the, the logic behind it and why we were approaching it this way and why we were running it this way, and so I was like, Jake, I don't get it. Why are we doing this? I, I'm confused. This doesn't make any sense to me, and, and what I loved and why I thought this was a good example is because I loved the way that Jake handled that. He said, okay, well, let me, let me walk you through what we're thinking and, and kind of the why behind it, and then let me know what you want us to do. And, and then he explained it to me, and I was like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Let, let's go with that. That's awesome. Let's do it that way. That's great. Thank you. I get it now. But in hindsight, I just felt so honored in that moment that he didn't just go, well, you're the boss, so whatever you want to do, we'll do it. Just tell us. No, he didn't do that. He didn't get frustrated. He didn't get annoyed. He wasn't like passive aggressive when I asked him to clarify and say it again. Instead, he honored me by speaking graciously to me. He wasn't like, well, you try working for you, you monster. Like that. <laughs> he might have thought that, but he didn't say that. Praise God. 
No, he loved and honored me enough to just speak the truth to me graciously. And, and I would hope that my mom would say the same thing about me as well. That when she doesn't know how to use her phone, one of the things that she does is she'll call me, she puts me on speakerphone, and she just like walks around the house, and it's like in and out, in and out. I'm like, I can't hear every other word. You have to put the phone to your face, sweet mother. Um, <laughs> Then one time, it wasn't that long ago, she was telling me, in, in all sincerity, she was texting me about a tragedy that had happened to somebody in, in the church. And she was like, so-and-so passed away. And she put like a, an emoji, but it was like the laughing out loud with crying tears emoji. And I was like, oh, mom, please tell me you didn't send that laughing out loud emoji to other people when you told them this news, because that's not a crying. It's a laughing so much that you're crying. And so I was trying to like help her, but I didn't want to like demean her, but I couldn't just let her keep going down that path. Is that fair? <laughs> or when she calls me and just asks me what seems like an obvious question, it, it has to be prayerful and intentional that I'm patient with her and that I speak to her in a way that honors and blesses her. And that's what we're called by God to do. We're called to speak graciously, but also to speak gratefully, gratefully. You know, when we honor somebody, like if we held a dinner in your honor, what we would do is we'd all get together, and we'd stand up, and we'd take a moment to tell everyone what a great job that you've done, what a, what a great job you've done. And that's what it means to honor somebody. It means that we speak well of you. And so one of the ways that we can honor our parents is to tell them, listen, before they die, don't wait for their funeral. Don't wait to eulogize them to tell them what they've done well, but to tell our parents what they've done well now, to celebrate them, to speak well of them. But some of you hear that and you go, but Pastor Tim, like you might have had a great upbringing, but I've come to realize a lot of, the, there, there's some pain in my life. I've experienced some tremendous disappointment and even some trauma, things that went wrong in my upbringing. There were opportunities that I wasn't given. I was robbed. I'm a victim. Woe is me. It's my parents' fault. We hear that a lot. And look, I'm sure some of that's true. Um, you weren't raised by perfect parents. I'm sure your parents and your upbringing had some challenges, maybe more than others. Maybe you did lose some things. Maybe you didn't have some things that your friends had. But I promise you that even your friends had problems too. Listen, every family has its struggles. Even the first family on planet Earth had struggles. Adam and Eve's son killed their other son. One brother murdered another. We are all dysfunctional, and we have been from the very beginning. It's called sin and depravity, but that doesn't mean, yes, our culture just focuses on that, but that doesn't mean that as the people of God, we can't be grateful for the good things that we've been blessed with. Amen. So my challenge to you, yeah, <laughs> my challenge to you is look hard if you have to. It may not come to you immediately what your mom or dad did to bless you and bless your life. So look hard if you have to. Take a moment to stop, to pray, to think about the good things that your parents have given you and what they've done for you. And then don't just think about them, tell them. Speak those words to them. Son, daughter, don't underestimate the need in your parents' heart to hear themselves reproduced in you. Tell them the things that they've done well, the things that you've imitated, the things that you saw in them that were beautiful that you now see in yourself. Tell them how they've blessed and positively impacted you and your life. The word parent means to come into existence. And for some of you, maybe you've been struggling what to even thank mom for today. You're like, I don't even know where to begin. I don't know what to say. We'll start with this. You exist. She literally birthed you. I know that. I don't know anything else your mom did, but I know your mom birthed you. So before Steve Jobs died, uh, of course, he was a famous dude, he went on a search for his mom, his biological mother. He had been adopted at birth, and before he died, he wanted to meet his biological mom. And of course, um, a, an interviewer found out, and they asked him why, and his response was simple and beautiful. He said, I just want to thank her. I just felt the need to express my gratitude to her. She was young, scared, and alone. She was pressured to abort, to abort me, but she was brave. And she made the hard, sacrificial decision to bring me into this world. We can all thank our mom for that today. 
The U.S. Department of Agriculture put out a report a few years ago, I'm sure it's gone up since then, but it stated that raising a child in the U.S. for 18 years costs, on average, $250,000, quarter of a million dollars. That doesn't include college. So if you're bitter, if you're thinking about all the things that mom or dad or both didn't give to you and your buddy got a scooter when he was seven and your other friend got a convertible when they turned 16 and you didn't, um, if things didn't go well for you, before you get too harsh, before you start saying woe is me and getting too judgmental against mom and dad, ask yourself, what human being have I dropped a quarter of a million dollars on? Because I bet some of you didn't even buy your mom a card because you didn't want to break the bank. Five dollars for a card, I'll just tell her. <laughs> it's not too late on your way home. Okay. You're like, that's not a laugh, it's an embarrassment. Okay. <laughs> so let me remind you, your parents have probably sacrificed more for you than you'll ever know this side of eternity. So children, regardless of your age, this doesn't say little children obey your parents. It doesn't put an age limit on it. It says, children, obey and honor your father and mother, for this is right. It's how God intended it to work. And things will go well with you. It'll go well for our culture. It'll go well for our world if you'll do what God's told you to do. And parents, what's our role? We have eight minutes to discuss it. Verse four says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. In other words, parents, raise your child in such a way that you don't frustrate them or discourage them. Now, I've always wondered, why doesn't Paul mention the mom here? Why does he only mention dad? And I'm not 100% sure, but I'm glad he did because today's Mother's Day and dads, we can take this one for the team. Amen? That's, I'm good with it. But here, Paul just says, hey, I want to put the responsibility of guiding the emotional development of the child in the camp of the fathers. And I don't think any one of us in here would complain going, well, that's the problem with our world, Pastor Tim. Too many fathers assuming responsibility. <laughs> here we go again. Like, no. Like, I think we would all agree that it's okay to stress this part to the dads. And so Paul warns them. He warns us saying, dads, do not provoke your children to anger, which begs the question, how do we do that? How do we tend as people to provoke our kids to wrath? Well, for one, by being overbearing, being overbearing. Listen, if you don't want to provoke your kids, then don't be unreasonably harsh with your kids. Don't be unfair. Don't be constantly nagging or condemning your children. As parents, we can very easily find ourselves nitpicking every little decision that our son or daughter makes. We can be so impatient with their process of development that we try to control too much for too long. Listen, you may have had to change their diapers when they were babies. You may have had to do their laundry when they were kids. You may have had to house them even through college. And you may have had to be very involved at a young age in the very details of their life, but there is a season for everything, including your parenting. And by the time your child is an adult, your relationship should be more about advising than deciding. It should be more about counseling than it is about commanding. The book of Proverbs in the Old Testament is all about a father who's writing to his adult son on how to live his life. And it's really a beautiful book. It's a powerful book. It's about a father speaking to his son as an advisor, as a counselor, as a giver of wisdom and experience. And throughout the book, he says things like, son, this is how some people in the world are going to try to cut corners and do things wrong financially. He says, don't listen to them, son. Son, here's how some people are going to wrongly pursue and express their sexuality in the world. Stay away from that behavior. Stay away from that false ideology. Son, here's how the world thinks and pursues their fleshly passions and desires. But son, here's where that road is going to lead. Don't go down that road. And yes, you hear this father counseling and pleading, but he's not demanding. Solomon isn't going, hey, son, I forbid you to go to that place, to that party, or to that event. No, because his son's not seven anymore. His son's a full-grown man. And yet what I don't want you to miss is that this godly father, Solomon, is still advising. He's still 
counseling. He's still speaking the truth to his son in love with godly biblical wisdom. Listen, I'm 39 years old. I lost my earthly father three years ago. My mom is still around, and I, I'm telling you now, she gives me more counsel, day-to-day counsel. She's the one I call. She's the one I ask questions to. She's the one who speaks into my life. 39 years old, I'm not going to outgrow that. We don't outgrow that. Children don't outgrow the need for their parents to speak into their life. Amen? We need you. So parents, don't provoke your children to anger by being overbearing, but also don't provoke your children by disappearing by disappearing. In other words, some parents are too hands-on for too long, (laughs) and other parents are too hands-off too quick, and that can hurt too. McGill University put out a report saying growing up without an involved, without an involved parent can permanently alter the structure of a brain and produce children who are more aggressive and angry. The secular report said children brought up without an involved parent have higher risks of developing what they called deviant behavior. In other words, disconnected and disappearing parents tend to produce angry children. Now, that's not always the case. Some of you may not have had both parents in the home. You may not have had either parent in the home. My wife didn't have her dad in the home, didn't even get to know him until she was, what, 30. She loves the Lord. She's not poorly tempered. But this is just what tends to happen. There is a downside when we disappear. Disconnected and disappearing parents tend to produce angry people. So what's the balance? Like how do we avoid being overbearing, over-controlling, but while not disappearing and just being like, you guys figure it out. I don't want to tell you what to do. I don't want to be a helicopter parent. How do we parent well, biblically well? Well, there's the answer. The command here is for the child. To obey your parents, how? In the Lord. The charge, the command is for the parents to bring up your kids, how? In the discipline and instruction of the Lord. In in other words, it's found in this balance of caring, but also knowing we can't control them. And so the only way that we're going to react, not in fear, but in faith, is by parenting in the Lord. It's by advising in the Lord. It's by correcting, counseling, and disciplining in the Lord. It's by ultimately going, look, I can't control where their life goes, but I can point them to the one who does. So we prayerfully ask, parents, God, give us the wisdom we need in every situation, through every season, the challenges that I'm going to face as a father when my kids are in their 20s are going to be very different than when they're in their twos. And God, I need wisdom for that season. I need strength in that season. I need to be in tune with you in that season. We ask the Lord to help us to speak into their life with either discipline or instruction. And the older they get, it's going to be a lot more of the latter. You're going to discipline your kids less and less and less, and you're simply going to be an advisor. You're going to be an instructor into their life. So what's a good parenting tip for those of you that have older kids or adult children? I think a really obvious tip is just ask a lot of questions. (laughs) Uh, Pastor Delton was telling me that whenever he takes his kids to school, drives them around, he's like, I just ask. I just ask him a bunch of things. I just want to, I want, if I don't ask now, I won't be able to ask later. I want to develop that rapport now. And and that's a beautiful tip. In other words, don't react in fear when they tell you something that you aren't comfortable with. Instead, respond with a question that allows you to press in further, that allows you to know their hearts. For instance, you know, it's that time of year where some of you might have a senior in high school. They're about to graduate, and uh, and maybe, you know, your soon-to-be graduating student comes up to you and says, Mom, I want to go to college in Washington. And everything in you is going to go, Oh! Washington, that's too far, that's too scary, that's too expensive. Take a deep breath, (laughs) say a prayer, hold that back, and just kind of go, okay, tell me where that's coming from. What led you to want to attend school there? Have you considered the cost, the culture, the politics, the climate, the distance? In other words, ask them questions to help them answer and make a decision. And as we press in with questions, as we try to get to the heart of it, there will be places where we encounter limits to even our adults' children's knowledge and experience. And as parents, we can say, okay, now this is my opportunity. 
Now that I see a limit in their response, this is my opportunity to speak into that with wisdom, with, with my knowledge, with my experience, with the word of God. Another way to parent in faith and not in fear, listen, this is an important one in our world today. Never downgrade, downplay, or minimize your role as a parent. Don't downgrade it. Why? Because if we as parents, if nothing else, if you hear nothing else today, mom and dad, if you will simply recognize that I've been ordained by God to raise you, to raise my kids, God has called me to that. He's commissioned me to that. He's called me to instill within you wisdom, discipline, and truth. Then, then if you'll just hold on to that, then you'll avoid falling into the trap or believing the cultural lie that our roles as mom and dad don't matter. They matter. Moms, we need you to mother. Dads, we need you to father. Parents, we need you to lead, to love, and to raise up the next generation to know God and to love God. You say, but Pastor Tim, what if I fall short of this lofty goal? You know, what if I fail as a parent? What if I fail as a mom? What if I fail as a father? Well, that's why Paul stresses that all of this must be done how? In the Lord. In other words, we've got to step into these roles by and through faith, by and through the wisdom of God, by and through the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ. And so if you're going, man, I'm not a perfect kid. I have not been a perfect son. I've not been a perfect daughter. I'm not a perfect parent. Then let me remind you that the answer in the gospel is, of course you're not. I know you're not. And that's why Jesus came. He came to live the perfect life that we could not live, to be the perfect caretaker, to be the perfect lover and leader of the human soul. And what he did is he took all of our sin, all of the sin of the world, all of the sin of humanity. He took that punishment of our failure. He took it away from us. And in exchange, he gave us righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And now, as a result of that, he offers to you, he extends to you both forgiveness and the power to live a better life than we could have ever possibly lived on our own. So when we come in and say, man, I'm not measuring up. I'm not measuring up as a child. I haven't been speaking graciously or gratefully. I'm not measuring up as a parent. I don't listen. I'm not attentive. I, I don't have a good balance of discipline and, and, and kind of releasing. We also sim simultaneously go, of course not. Of course I don't. I'm a sinner and I'm broken. But praise be to God that he comes into my rebellion and he comes into my brokenness and he forgives me and he cleanses me and he restores me and he empowers me to live a better life, to be a better child, to be a better parent than I could have ever possibly been on my own. Listen, Jesus can step into any broken family. He can step into any broken heart and he can take things that you thought might be forever twisted and he can make them straight. He can take things that you thought, man, this is gonna be broken forever and Jesus can come in and he can make it whole. That's the beauty and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as children, we obey our parents in the Lord. As parents, we raise, we rear, we discipline, we speak well to our kids in the Lord. And as we do, just watch and see what God will do when we honor the structure that he's instituted, that he's established. What he'll do is he'll replace your fear with faith. He'll replace your mourning with rejoicing. He'll give you beauty in exchange for your ashes. And in the end, things will go well for you if you do things God's way if you trust him, if you obey him, if you parent the way he's called you, if you are a child the way he's called you, things will go well 